Good morning, everybody. Uh, in this month, we're looking at the new AASB 16 or IFRS 16 on leases, and we're particularly focusing on identifying a lease and also determining the lease term. Now, you will remember that in January this year, our very first webinar for 2017, I gave you a bit of an overview of the requirements of the new AASB 16. This month and next month, we are diving a little bit deep deeper into the details. So welcome to this webinar uh, and for the next two months it's all about leases. Now in this session uh, what we'll be looking at, in just a second I just want to move this a little bit, struggling here on my side. Um, so in this session I've divided up into four sections. First of all, we'll do a quick recap of, of the overview of the new AASB 16 leases. So it's a, a quick recap of that January webinar. Then I'll move on to a section on identifying a lease. The third section, determining the lease term. And then the last section, some key messages. As always, please remember that this is training and it's not formal technical advice. And uh, if you need technical advice, please contact your BDO representative or contact. So let's look at an overview of the new AASB 16 leases. Now the big thing is that there's a change for lessees. It's the end of the road for operating leases. So if you're a lessor, not much is changing for you, small little things. However, if you're a lessee and you have operating leases, then there's a big change for you. And why is that the case? Because the new AASB 16 introduces a single lessee accounting model where all leases will be accounted for in a similar manner. And what would that manner be? The way we currently account for finance leases. So going forward, this is the interesting bit, going forward, lessors will still have to distinguish between a finance lease and an operating lease. And lessors will still have different accounting treatment for finance leases and operating leases. However, if you're a lessee, all leases, each and every lease will be accounted for in exactly the same way. And that would be how we currently account for finance leases. So very big picture, what does that mean? Uh, as soon as you've got a lease, on day one we will debit an asset, a right of use asset, and on day one we would credit a liability. And it's a liability for all the lease payments that we have to make over the period of the lease. So that's on day one, we've got an asset and a liability. After that, the asset will be depreciated over the period of the lease and the liability will be repaid through the lease payments. And our lease payments will have to be split between an interest component, which is an expense, and a capital component, which is a repayment of that liability. So we would now have to prepare an amortization table for each and every lease. So if you're a lessee, for each and every lease, you need an amortization table. So therefore, you can already hear that it has a big impact on processes and systems. And do you have the staff, the processes to do that, um, and the time to do all of that? Now, a lot of people have asked, um, so, you know, why do we have this change? Now, a big reason for the change, and I suppose this is the most famous IFRS quote that I've heard is a quote by Sir David Tweedy, who's the former chair of the International Accounting Standards Board. And he said that one of his greatest ambitions uh, is to fly on an aeroplane, on an aircraft, that's on the airline's balance sheet. Because currently, under AASB 117, the airlines would lease those aircrafts under an operating lease, and therefore, the aircraft is not in the balance sheet of the airline, and there's also no liability in the balance sheet of the airline. So he would like those planes to be on the balance sheet of the airline, and he wants to see that liability. So no longer do we just hide an operating lease commitment in the notes, and the very last note, the commitments notes, but it's actually um, a liability in the financial statements. 
So really, the reason would be that they want greater transparency of a lessee's financial leverage as well as capital employed. And they do not want off-balance sheet financing. So they didn't like, and the standard setters didn't like the idea that you could structure a lease um, through the use of lawyers, etc., and come up with an operating lease which gets to off-balance sheet financing. They want you to have all leases on the balance sheet. All right, there are some limited exceptions. Um, if I say all leases on balance sheet, the one is on low-value assets, and the other one is on <coughs> short-term leases. I thought it would be interesting to flag um, a newspaper article that was in the Australian, and I've given you there uh, the link to the website where you can find it. And it was around the retail food group. So if you're a retail client, you'd be very interested in it. And that was saying that the retail food group, the shares have suffered their biggest fall in nine years after UBS said changes to international accounting standards could cause a material impact on the company's debt profile. And that is the changes around IFRS 16 and the fact that we're now going to book liabilities for all these operating leases. So you can imagine as a retailer, they have lots and lots, hundreds of leases for all the space they lease um, to run their operations out of, and they now have to bring all those operating leases onto the balance sheet. So that was an interesting article that I've seen earlier in the year, um, all around what IFRS 16 is going to mean for this retail company. But you know, as soon as you have a lot of operating leases, a similar thing would apply to you. So I thought at this stage, uh, let's have our first poll, just get an indication. Um, first of all, oh sorry, what have I done? Not, I have to launch a poll. Are you currently, my question, are you currently a lessee in an operating lease? So let's see whether this standard would have an impact on you. So I've got a lot of attendees today. This is a popular standard. People want to know more. So how many of our attendees actually are lessees in an operating lease? And if you answer yes, you will be impacted by the standard. So it would be interesting to get the stats. We've got nearly 60% of our attendees have voted. Um, it would be nice if we could get that percentage a little bit higher. So are you currently a lessee? Uh, in an operating lease. And then I, I, I haven't asked you to give me an indication of um, to what extent, but just think to yourself, how many operating leases do you have? So at this stage, we've got 65% of our attendees have uh, voted. So let's share that uh, result. And you can see 81% of our attendees have an operating lease. And, and that's not surprising because most people have an operating lease of a building, whether it's a factory, an admin building, a warehouse, and, and definitely if you're a retailer, um, you know, you can have a lot of shops or retail spaces. Right, so if we move on, let's start with identifying a lease. Uh, so currently under AASB 117, the critical thing uh, for a lessee um, and lessors would be to decide whether they've got a finance lease or an operating lease. Going forward, the critical thing would be to determine whether you've got a lease or not. So as soon as you've got a lease, you are captured by IFRS 16. If you don't have a lease, you apply another appropriate or relevant standard and usually it ends up being, yes, then it's a service contract and you would expense um, as the service is provided uh, to you. So critical, do we have a lease? And that's why I, have to, I want to start with identifying a lease. Now if you look at identifying a lease, we start with looking at the definition of a lease. Now the standard IFRS 16 says a lease is a contract or a part of a contract that conveys the right to use an asset, an underlying asset, 
for a period of time in exchange for consideration. So it's a contract or a part of a contract. So that already says to us, we're not just looking at the whole thing, it could be a part of a contract. Um, and we conveying to use the right to kind of use an asset or an underlying asset for a period of time and there is some consideration involved. Now interesting, they also say that a period of time may also be described in terms of an amount of use of an asset. So what do I mean by that? A number of production units that a piece of machinery will produce. So it could be that you've got a contract to use a machine to produce 100,000 production units. So it doesn't specifically refer to you can use the machine for five years. It says you can use the machine to produce 100,000 units. It's still a lease. So production units, period of time, are very similar and that's specifically included in the standard. That's interesting. If we look at applying the definition of a lease, now, AASB 16 provides new guidance to evaluate whether your contract contains a lease or not. Um, and AASB 16's guidance actually replaces three current standards and interpretations. So it's AASB 117 on leases, the current interpretation 4, determining whether an arrangement contains a lease, and also the current interpretation 1 to 7 evaluating the substance of transactions involving the legal form of a lease. I think it's important to note that the guidance in AASB 16 are more extensive and have a different threshold, therefore the conclusions you've reached under the current guidance would not necessarily be exactly the same as the conclusions you reach under the new AASB 16. So for your leases and for your contracts, you'll have to do an assessment under the new AASB 16. So how do we apply that definition of a lease? How do we do that? What are the criteria? Now we've prepared this decision tree and the first criteria is, on the left hand side, is there an identified asset? That's the first criteria. If you say no, then the contract does not contain a lease and you apply an other applicable standard and quite often it would just end up being a service contract. If you say yes, I do have an identified asset, the next question is, does the lessee obtain substantially all the economic benefits? Again, if you say no, it's not a lease. If you say yes, you go on to the third criteria, does the lessee have the right to direct the use of the asset? Again, if you say no, you're out of AASB 16. If you say yes, the contract would contain a lease. So there are three criteria. And you have to answer yes to each criteria in order to get to the conclusion that your contract contains a lease. So if we uh, look at the first criteria, is there an identified asset? Um, and we discuss that a little bit more. So first of all, uh, typically an asset will be explicitly identified in a contract. So the contract would say, this is a contract to use asset A. So it's definitely specifically included in the contract. Alternatively, an asset could be implicitly identified. And how is that done? So we've just got a contract to use an asset. However, on the day that they make that asset available to you, the lessee, or at the day that they install that asset on your premises, implicitly you know that is the asset I've got the right to use. So although that asset is not named in the contract, the fact that they deliver that particular asset to my premises means it is implicitly identified. Now, the interesting bit is, even if a contract specifies a particular asset, you have to consider that a customer or a lessee does not have the right to use that asset if the supplier has a substantive right to substitute the asset throughout the period of use. So it could be explicitly stated this is the asset you can use or it could be implicitly we deliver this asset implicitly that's the asset I'm going to use. 
However, I now have to go and look at my contract and say, do the supplier have a substantive right to substitute this asset throughout the period of use? And if I say, yes, the supplier has that substantive right, then the customer doesn't have a right to use that particular asset. So that is something to always take into consideration. So if we think about you know, substantive right, when would a supplier have a substantive right? Now that supplier's right would be substantive if both the following conditions are met. So first of all, the supplier has the practical ability to substitute alternative assets throughout the period of use. So practically they could do it. They could say, you've got one asset, take it away, here's another asset. And, and this is important, the supplier would benefit economically from the exercise of its rights to substitute the asset. So there should be some economic benefit for them to substitute the asset. So in situations where the lessor has the right to substitute an asset, we should assess whether the lessor has a compelling reason to exercise that right. If they don't have a compelling reason, uh, so a compelling reason is there's economic benefit, if they don't have a compelling reason to exercise that right, we wouldn't say that they've got a, subs um, a substantive right. Um, in that case, it would only be a pr protective right. So do we have the ability to substitute the asset and would we economically benefit as the supplier to substitute the asset? If we say yes to all of that, so that really means they've got a compelling reason to substitute that asset, then we would say they've got a substantive right and therefore we don't have an identified asset. Um, so again, the standard goes on and provides some examples and the following are not substantive rights of substitution. So if the asset is located at the lessee's premises or elsewhere away from the lessor and therefore the cost to substitute the asset may outweigh any perceived benefit to the lessor. So on the lessee's premises I've got this asset, it is quite far away from the lessor. Yes, they can substitute the asset, but why would they? It could cost them so much to substitute the asset. And therefore, you know, what would the benefit be? There's no compelling reason to substitute the asset. So in that instance, we would say the customer um, um, would argue that there's an identified asset. The second one is the supplier has a right to substitute an asset for the purposes of repairs or maintenance. So the asset is not working properly and therefore the supplier says, listen, here's another um, asset, we'll give you one that's working or we'll come and fix it. The fact that they can swap it over with another asset that actually is working and is operating properly doesn't mean they've got a substantive right of substitution. They're just keeping that asset in a working condition for the customer. And then also, if a supplier has a right to upgrade an asset, when a technical update becomes available, again, they're just giving you the new enhancements, technical updates. It doesn't give them a substantive right of substitution. Um, they also say, and this is really interesting, in situations where it's not readily determinable whether a supplier's, supplier has substantive substitution rights or not, a customer shall presume that any substitution right is not substantive. So really we have to look for a compelling reason. We have to make sure we tick all the boxes, we comply with both criteria on the previous slide before we would argue that the supplier has a substantive right and therefore us, the customer, don't have an identified asset. Right. So that's criteria one. Let's look at an example to illustrate that. Now in this scenario I've said a customer enters into a 10-year contract with a freight carrier, the supplier, to transport the customer's goods. Now the contract requires the supplier to use a rail cars of a particular specification and it will require 20 rail cars to transport the required quantity of goods over the 10-year term of the contract. Now, a supplier has a large pool of rail cars that can be used to fulfill the contract. 
and all rail cars are stored at the supplier's premises when they are not being used to transport the goods. And the cost associated with substituting the rail cars are minimal for the supplier. Now, question is, are the supplier's substitution rights substantive? Now, this is a critical question because if, if it's substantive, then the customer cannot argue that we've got an identified asset, therefore we won't have a lease. So in this situation, the supplier's substitution rights are substantive for two reasons. It has the practical ability to substitute the rail cars throughout the period of use, and it would benefit economically from substituting the rail cars. Why? There's a large pool of them available, they are stored at its premises, and the potential benefits for the supplier in deploying the rail cars to a nearby location for use in other contracts or um, to use any of the 10 rail cars that are sitting idle for other purposes uh, because they're not currently being used by the customer. So they could say, listen, um, we have to give you 10, we've got 20, we substitute them, we give you the ones that's most appropriate, the ones that's closest, otherwise the others we use for other customers. Um, so therefore, although the contract makes use of identified assets, the, the, rail, uh, the, the rail cars, the contract does not contain a lease of those rail cars because the supplier has substantive substitution rights. They're going to give us any of their 20 rail cars. Uh, in substance, they're just providing a service to us. We're not leasing 10 particular rail cars, uh, we're obtaining a service from them. So that's the first criteria. Um, to maybe extend that a little bit further, we could also have a capacity portion of an asset maybe identified um, if it is physically distinct. Now, an example here is we are just leasing a floor of a building. Um, so we're not using the whole building, we're not leasing the whole building, we're just using a floor of a building. That could still be an identified asset. Um, there's also a situation where a capacity portion of an asset is not distinct. So that would be a situation where we've got a spe specified capacity of a fibre optic cable. Um, so we're saying we're going to use 30% of a fiber optic cable. We don't know which 30%. So let's say there are 10 cables within the fiber optic cable. We are leasing 30% of that cable. So we're leasing three strands in that cable. We don't know which three. It could be any three. Um, you know, one day it's this one or one hour it's this one because it can be um, swapped around by the supplier and we don't have the sole use of a particular cable um, or a particular part, uh, that would not be an identified asset. So if we look at identifying a lease and we're looking at the second criteria, so firstly we looked at is there an identified asset which is the starting point. Uh, the second question or criteria is, does the lessee obtain substantially all the economic benefits? <coughs> now I have to explain that a little bit further. So you don't confuse it with the current requirements in AASB 117 uh, where you try and distinguish between a finance lease and an operating lease. You look at the economic benefits over the useful life of the asset leased. That's not what we're looking at here. We're saying you assess whether the customer has the right to obtain substantially all of the economic benefits from use of the asset, and now this is the emphasis, throughout the period of use. So if I've got a contract that I'm going to use an asset for three years, do I get all the economic benefits from that asset during the three years? It's not do I get all the economic benefits of the asset's useful life. So that asset could have a useful life of 20 years and I'm getting all the economic benefits in only three years 
but my contract is for three years and I'm getting all the economic benefits for those three years. And therefore I would say, yes, I do meet criteria two because I get all the economic benefits throughout the period of my contract and throughout the period of use. So that would be an example is having an exclusive um, use of an asset throughout the period of the contract or by having a right to sublease that asset throughout the period of the contract. Um, and the customer can obtain economic benefits from using this asset or holding the asset or subleasing the asset. So economic benefits are defined quite widely. Uh, economic benefits from use of an asset include primary outputs and byproducts, uh, so including cash flows derived therefrom. So it's not just my primary outputs that are economic benefits, it could be other uh, byproducts. Um, simply because lease payments include cash flows derived from use of an asset, um, so that's for example percentage of sales in a retail tenancy, does not mean the lessee does not obtain substantially all of the economic benefit. So some people were arguing, oops, and there the lights go off. Thank you very much for switching that back on for me. I'm in the dark, at least I can see my screen. Um, so we can't argue because our lease payments um, include cash flows derived from the use is a percentage of sales, uh, therefore I don't get all of the, the, the benefits uh, uh, or substantially all the economic benefits. I'll show you an example to illustrate that point. Let's say a retailer enters into a contract for the lease of a store in a shopping center for five years. Now the rental terms include payments equal to 10% of the gross sales revenue generated from the store. So I don't have a fixed payment, lease payment, I'm going to pay the, um, the lessor 10% of my sales revenue. Now in that situation the retailer has the right to determine which products are to be sold in his store, they can decide on the interior design of their store, they're absolutely in control of their store. But at the end of the day, to determine how much their lease payment is, they look at sales and 10% of that they pay over. So is the lessee obtaining substantially all the economic benefits from use of that asset throughout the period of use? Or can you now suddenly argue, listen, the fact that I'm paying 10% over to the lessor means I'm not no longer getting substantially all the economic benefits. Right? That's what we're trying to determine here. And the answer is, uh, it's the customer's control and it's the customer's use of the property that generates the sales revenue. So your retailer controls the property, decides what to sell, uh, decides on marketing and advertising and fit out of their store. The fact that a portion of the cash flows will be used to pay to the lessor doesn't mean that the lessee doesn't get substantially all the economic benefits. The lessee has a right to 100% of that sales revenue generated from the store, um, but then they've negotiated a separate contract where instead of paying a fixed amount to the lessor, they're paying a percentage over in rent. So that scenario wouldn't mean that you cannot argue that the lessee um, op doesn't obtain substantially all of the economic benefits. Um, still looking at does the lessee obtain substantially all the economic benefits? In assessing whether a customer has a right to substantially all the economic benefits, the assessment is made based on the assets used within the scope of the contract. And I think that's what I've tried to explain earlier. We don't look at the assets expected use for life. We look at the assets use within the scope of the contract only. So two examples. If a contract limits the use of a vehicle to only a particular geographic area, an entity assesses only the economic benefits from the use of that vehicle within that particular geographic area. It does not consider what economic benefits could be obtained had there not been any geographical restriction. My contract says I can use it within this area. Am I the lessee getting all the benefits from the use of this vehicle in this area? Yes. 
then I get substantially all the benefits. Another example, if a contract specifies a machine can only be utilized during specific times of the day, an entity assesses only the economic benefits from the use of that machine during that time of the day. So it does not consider what economic benefits could be obtained from using the machine 24 hours a day. So we could have a situation where I am using an asset in the morning and somebody else is using an asset in the afternoon and somebody else is using the asset throughout the night. So I just look at my contract. I have a contract to use this machine in the morning. For criteria two, do I get all of the benefits from the use of that machine during the morning? That's all I look at. So it's very limited to the scope of the contract. Then in criteria three, the question is, does the lessee have the right to direct the use of the asset? So we've already said at this stage, there is an identified asset. We obtain substantially all the economic benefits from this asset for that period of our contract, I should add. Now we have to consider, but can I also, as the lessee or the potential lessee, direct the use of the asset? That's the last criteria. Now for criteria three, there are three potential answers here. The question really is, who directs how and for what purpose the asset is used throughout the period of use. So who decides? If I've got a contract to use the asset every morning, who decides how and for what purpose that asset is used during the morning? Now it could be that the supplier directs how and for what purpose it's used, and then the contract would not contain a lease. It could be that the customer at the bottom directs how and for what purpose the asset is used and then the contract would contain a lease. Or it could be that how and for what purpose the asset is used has been predetermined due to the nature of the asset. And if it's been predetermined, we have to perform an analysis to determine that. So if we look at does the lessee have the right to direct the use of the asset, um, examples of decision-making rights that may grant the right to change how and for what purpose an asset is used include the rights to change the following. So how do we make that assessment? Um, if we've got the right to change the type of output um, that is produced by the asset, uh, for example, what type of food certain food processing equipment produces, then we would argue we've got the right to direct the use of the asset. So, you know, the processing equipment initially produced a certain item. I can't see the slides. What's going on? Why is that going? Sorry, I've just got feedback that you can't see the slides. And that is concerning. Thank you very much for sending that through to me or contact me, contacting me about that. I do apologize. I think all of you at this stage have just been looking at me and that must be a nightmare. Um, hopefully the slides are back up and running. Um, all right, everybody, everything ready. Thank you very much for contacting me. That is a, a long time for not seeing the slides. I hope you could access it through the handouts and follow and follow that way or you've received it earlier. My apologies. All right, so the first one is the type of output uh, that is produced by the asset. Um, you've got control over that, you make the decisions. The second bu bullet point, when the output is produced, uh, for example, the regular operating hours of the equipment. Um, so we are leasing the equipment um, for a period of three years. Uh, and, and we can decide, or we leasing uh, um, retail stores, and we can decide what the operating hours are of the retail stores, or we could decide that we're going to use the equipment during the day, or we're going to decide we're now going to use it 24 hours a day. We've got that ability, um, you know, then we would say we've got the right to direct the use of the asset. 
Um, also where the output is produced, so the physical location of the machinery um, or the destinations and routes for transport equipment, uh, we can chop and change it based on our needs, then we've got the right to direct the use of the asset, and then also whether the output is uh, whether the output is produced and the quantity of the output. Uh, so we could, for example, decide whether to produce energy from a power plant and how much energy to produce, or you know, to change it to a more less different plant. So if we can make these decisions, we have decision making rights that give us the right to change how and for what purpose an asset is used. Um, if we look at decision making rights relating to operating or maintaining an asset, um, they do not grant the right to change how and for what purpose an asset is used. So if you can just make certain decisions, you know, what maintenance to be done, um, and it's just operating decisions, that doesn't give you decision making rights um, to, to say that you can direct the use of the asset. Um, I think what's important to note here is that the guidance on determ determining who has the right to direct use of the asset is focused on control. Right? So who has control of that asset? And who has control of the asset for the period um, stipulated in the contract? So whether that is who has control of the asset for a three-year period or who has control um, of the asset um, uh, during the mornings uh, w where we contractually have the ability to use the asset. Um, we did say in criteria three, there's three alternatives. Um, it could be that the supplier has these decision making rights, then we don't have a lease. It could be the customer has the rights and don't, then we don't have the right um, to direct the use of the asset. Or it could be that it's been predetermined. So the relevant decisions have been predetermined and then we need further analysis. Um, so for an asset where the relevant decisions are predetermined, the contract contains a lease if the customer has the right to operate the asset or to direct others to operate in an asset in a manner that it determines throughout the period of use without the supplier having the right to change those operating instructions. So it's still within the customer's ability. The customer operate the asset, it's been predetermined, the supplier can't change it, it's a done deal. Or the customer designed the asset or specific aspects of the assets in a way that predetermines how and for what purpose this asset will be used throughout the period. So it's all about the customer pre-designed it or the customer is operating it based on pre-designed um, criteria and it can't be changed. You're looking for the customer to have control and not the supplier, even if it's been predetermined. So we go back to the previous slide. The guidance on determining who has the right to direct the use of the asset is focused on control and we want that control to be in the hands of the customer in order to have a lease. So let's look at an example or a scenario. So in this scenario, a customer enters into a contract with a supplier where the customer will purchase 100% of the energy produced by a biomass facility. Now the customer designed the biomass facility before it was constructed by hiring experts in the field to assist in determining what is the best location of the facility and the engineering of the equipment to be used. So it's all under the customer's direction. The supplier, however, is responsible for building the facility to the customer's specifications and the supplier then has to operate and maintain it. There are no decisions to be made about whether, uh, when or how much electricity will be produced because the design of the asset has predetermined those decisions. So everywhere in the scenario, the customer decide, decided on the best place, the customer hired experts, the customer made all these decisions, it's all been predetermined. Yes, the supplier is operating it on behalf of the customer. 
So in this situation, who directs how and for what purpose this asset is used throughout the period of use? The supplier is operating it, but clearly the customer has set the scene. In assessing the right to direct the use of the asset, the functionality of the facility is predetermined based on its design and those predeterminations were made by the customer. Therefore, the customer has the right to direct the use. Although the customer is not operating, maintaining it, the customer predetermined how this asset will be used. So that's the third criteria and a good example of that. What I've done in this decision tree, it's just a little bit of an alternative uh, format. Um, you'll know earlier, and I'll just go back because I know you've not been seeing the slides, you've been looking at me. Um, sorry, let me go back. If you look here at applying the definition of the lease, I've stepped you through this decision tree. You start on the left, is there an identified asset? Then you say, okay, if there's an asset, does the lessee obtain substantially all the economic benefits? If you said yes, does the lessee have the right to direct use of the asset? If you say yes to all three criteria, you would say there's a lease. And that's the diagram we've worked through. However, I've also prepared an alternative. And this alternative starts at the top, which is the same questions. Is there an identified asset? Yes, second criteria. Does the customer have the right to obtain substantially all of the economic benefits from use of the asset throughout the period of use? If you say yes, third criteria, does the customer, the supplier or neither party have the right to direct how or for what purpose the asset is used throughout the period of use? So if you say the customer has that ability, Yes, we go straight through to we've got a lease. If you say it's a supplier, no lease. And the neither is a situation where it's been predetermined. And now we've got two criteria. Does the customer have the right to operate the asset throughout the period of use? The supplier cannot change it. If you say yes to that, automatically it's a lease. If you say no to that, there's another question. Did the customer design it? If you say yes, they've designed it, it's a lease. So in this decision tree, I've combined the three criteria as well as the decision tree that I've given you here, the light blue one for criteria three. So my decision tree is a combination of criteria one, two, and three, as well as this particular decision tree. So it's just an alternative presentation, and you could use the one that you prefer. Still talking about identifying a lease, it is important that you have to look at your contracts and understand that in a contract there could be just a component of that contract that's a lease and the rest of the contract could be non-lease components. So for any contract we have to assess whether the whole contract is a lease or whether just a component of that contract is a lease. They also say, and I mean that can be complicated and time consuming, what they also say for us here is that there are two options. Um, your lease and your non-lease components can be bundled together. So you've got an accounting policy choice and it's an accounting policy choice by class of underlying asset, not on an asset by asset basis, class of underlying asset. You could either say I know in this contract I've got lease and non-lease components and what I want to do, uh, I want to allocate the consideration to each lease component based on relative standalone price for each lease component and non-lease component separately. So I want to split it out and account for it separately. So the lease component will go on balance sheet and the non-lease component I'll apply the appropriate accounting standard. Or you could say, um, and it's your accounting policy choice on a class of asset basis, you could say, listen, I want to account uh, for my lease component and the associated non-lease component as a single lease. Uh, so I'm happy to bring the whole thing on balance sheet uh, to simplify. Uh, I'm not going to go through the hassle of splitting it out, allocating it on a relative standalone basis. Um, so it's important that it's only 
for the lease component and associated non-lease components. Uh, you can't put all kinds of weird and wonderful things with the lease. It's just for the lease and associated contracts. So at this stage, I thought it might be time for another polling question. And this polling question um, is, would you prefer to separate your leases into the various components? Or would you just keep it all together? What would you prefer? I thought I'll try and get a quick idea of what attendees think. So, you know, if you, you've got this accounting policy choice, would you prefer to combine them, put it all on the balance sheet, or would you prefer to separate them out? Uh, so you'll have a smaller amount, obviously, on your balance sheet, uh, and you'll be able to treat uh, the non-lease components potentially as service aspects. That would be for the maintenance parts. Um, you know, you've got a lease of a building, and there's also a contract to do security. Uh, you also pay for security services. You pay for cleaning services. You pay for maintenance services. Will you bring the whole thing on your balance sheet, or would you like to account for those other services separately as an expense when incurred? So we nearly have 60% of you uh, voting. So would you prefer to separate your lease? I mean, there are pros and cons and, uh, on both. So we've got around 60% of people voted now. So let's share that. Uh, there you can see 33% of you said you would prefer to separate. The benefit is um, that your asset and liability on your balance sheet will be smaller and you'll still get an even lease expense or, sorry, you'll still get an even expense in your P&L in respect of the services you're paying for, security services, cleaning services, uh, maintenance services. Um, and 46% said, no, we'll just keep it together. We're happy to book the bigger asset and liability in our balance sheet. So that's very interesting. If we move on to determining the lease term, so let's say our first step is we have to determine whether we have a lease. And as I said, under IFRS 16, that's going to be the big judgment call. Do I have a lease in the first place? Because once you've got a lease, um, with limited exceptions, only two exceptions, limited exceptions, you have to apply IFRS 16. So a big call, do I have a lease? Uh, just to recap from our January webinar, what are the two exceptions? Um, you've got a lease, but it's for a short term, less than 12 months. Um, you don't have to apply IFRS 16. Um, the other exception is you've got a lease of a low value item. You don't have to apply IFRS 16. Otherwise, if you've got a lease, you have to apply IFRS 16. Now, to apply IFRS 16, the next step is to determine your lease term. Now, again, this could be quite judgmental. Um, looking at uh, determining the lease term, please remember that it's a big call and it can have a big impact on the numbers in your statement of financial position. Because usually the longer your lease term, it would be the greater the amount of your right of use asset and your lease liability that will be booked on day one. Because if I'm making the call, my lease term is for five years, I have to net present value on day one, the lease payments I'll make over the next five years. However, if I make the call that my lease term is 10 years, because I'm going to exercise an option to extend, then my net present value is lease payments that will be made over a period of 10 years, hence a bigger number on day one. Uh, the lease term consists of three particular aspects that you have to consider. The first one is the non-cancellable -cancel period of the lease, plus, and that's you know fairly standard, the second part is lease extension options, but only if it's reasonably certain that you're going to exercise those extension options. So this is judgment call. Is it reasonably certain that you're going to exercise those extension options? The third aspect, there might be that the lessee has termination options. And you'll only take termination options into account 
if it's reasonably certain that you're not going to exercise those. So you'll only include the period in your lease term if you think it's reasonably certain that you're not going to exercise that option to terminate the contract. That's what it's saying. And that will give you your lease term. So then again, your lease term begins at the commencement date. So what is the commencement date? It's the date on which the lesser makes the underlying asset available for use by the lessee. So the lease term is when that asset is made available. And it includes any rent-free periods provided to the lessee by the lessor. So if I make, <coughs> if the lessor make the asset available for use to the lessee on the 1st of January, but the lessee only starts to make lease payments on the 1st of July that year, so there's a six-month rent-free period. Um, that six months from 1 January to 1 July is still part of the lease term. And therefore, at the commencement date, you book the right of use asset and the liability. Over the first six months, there will be no repayment, and therefore no repayment of the loan, but you will have an interest expense for each of the six months and you ha have a depreciation over those six months. So rent-free periods will be very interesting under the new IFRS 16. If we look e at each of those um, in turn, individually, the first one um, is the non-cancellable period of a, of a lease is usually or is as defined in your contract. So for this period of time, nobody can cancel, you can't cancel, that's it. So that's fixed. It is the period under which the terms of the contract are enforceable until both the lessee and the lessor each have a right to terminate the contract or the term ceases. So the emphasis on the both. So it's enforceable for a period of three years. The lessee and the lessor after three years now get the right to terminate. It has to be that both have the right to terminate. Um, you only only extension and termination options held by the lessee are considered when determining the lease term. So if you go back to the previous slide, you'll see uh, that I've only referred to lessee extension options and lessee termination options. So if the lessor has an option to terminate or the lessor has an option um, to extend, we don't take that to account in assessing the lease term because how do we know what the intention of the lessor are? So if a lessor has termination rights, that non-cancellable period of the lease includes the period of time covered um, by this lessor termina termination option um, because AASB 16 requires us and says we have to, the lessee has to assume that a lesser will continue to enforce a contract over the period of time during which the lesser has the sole unilateral right to terminate the contract. Um, so that's an assumption we made. Otherwise, we have to start to guess what all these other lessers are going to do. So we focus on looking at the lease term. We're looking at our lease termination options and our lessee extension options and not the lessors. Um, maybe before we look at these extension options, I'll ask you a question. Um, do you or do your leases have extension options? That would be interesting to know. Currently, your leases that you enter into, do they have extension options? Would this apply to you? Is this relevant to you? I suppose I should clarify my question. Do your leases have extension options for you, the lessee? Because we're not interested in the lessor's options, extension options. Do you, as the lessee, have extension options in your leases? Voting is going well. We've got about 54% of people voted. Let's see if we can at least get to 60%. Um, would be interesting to see. Nearly there, a few more people to vote. Yeah, there we are. So, very interesting. 76% uh, of you said you have extension options, so you'll be interested in the next part of the presentation. 13% said no, 
11%, not sure, but 76% of you will have to make some kind of assessment, make a judgment call around these extension options. Very interesting. Maybe um, the next question before we go on, do your leases have termination options for you, uh, the lessee? So 76% said, yes, we've got um, extension options. How many of you have termination options for you, the lessee? I suspect it would be high as well. Doesn't look exactly the same. Let's get to 60% of you voted, then we can compare it. Uh, would be interested in compare the two. I'll give a little bit more time to see if we can get 60% of people voting. All right, so we've got there. So interesting, if we look at termination options, um, only 35% of you say as a lessee you have a termination option, uh, whereas 76%, more than double that, have extension options. Interesting. All right, so let's go back to the requirements. Now the requirements for lease extension options and termination options are fairly similar in that we only look at the options in the hands of lessees and the lessee has to consider all the relevant facts and circumstances um, that create an economic incentive for them to exercise those options. So you'll have to, you have to make a judgment call right on day one. I'm locked in for five years and I've got an option to extend for another five years. Consider all the facts and circumstances. On day one, do I think or do I expect or do I assess in my judgment that we will extend? Therefore, uh, instead of using a lease term of five years, I'm going to use a lease term of 10 years. Now, a number of people could have multiple options to extend. So I've got a lease for five years, I've got an option to extend for five years, another option to extend for another five years. So in that instance, potentially the lease term would be 15 years. So factors they want us to consider to use for our judgment to determine lease term is comparison with market rates. So what would our lease payments be for those optional periods? Um, and any purchase option that is exercisable at the end of an extension period at a price that is below market value, uh, I would say, listen, I'll definitely do that. Um, if I'm leasing it for five years and at the end of the five years I can extend at a rate or lease payment less than what a market rate is expected to be at that stage, surely I would extend because it's good for me. I've got a compelling reason to extend. Or do I have certain leasehold improvements? Um, and if I've made significant leasehold improvements, um, I would like to extend because I would continue to use the leasehold improvements. Um, maybe there are costs relating to termination. Um, you know, I don't want to terminate because there will be costs, so that's a deterrent, I'll rather extend. Um, also, what is the importance of that particular underlying asset to the lessee's operations? So if I'm leasing a particular store in a shopping centre as a retailer and that store is my best performing store, uh, I think there's again a compelling reason for me to extend my lease. Um, or I've, you, I'm using an asset in a partic particular region that I will continue to use, would like to continue to use. Um, so if there's some conditions associated with an ex exercise option, um, we have to consider whether um, those conditions we think it will be met or not, and, and, and actually what are the likelihood of those conditions being met. So this is again a big judgment call. So earlier today we talked about judgment call on whether we have a lease in the first place. And then as soon as you start to do the journals or think about the journals, another big judgment call, what is the lease term? Um, so very important that you start to think about this and have a, have a discussion or do some research. Um, what is your past practice? So what is a lessee's past practice with their leases, particularly leases of similar assets? Um, so, you know, what is the likelihood? likelihood of us terminating or what is the likelihood of us extending based on past experience 
did we extend in the past or did we terminate in the past? Because that kind of builds a case for the judgment call or the assessment you are now making. Um, and you could use that to convince your auditor of whatever your assessment you come up with. Um, you also have to assess the reason for exercising such options. Um, you know, so is it just based on a single criteria that you've exercised the option or could it be a number of different uh, reasons and there are synergies and there's a number of reasons to consider? So assess, you know, in the past, why did you decide to extend uh, um, or exercise that extension option or terminate? Um, and it's important that um, this is a unique decision for every particular lessee. Um, so two lessees may determine different lease terms um, on identical assets or on identical lease contracts because based on the facts and circumstances of the lessee and the way that particular lessee operate, they could get to a different conclusion on um, their expected lease term. So that's a very interesting one and a big judgment call which we'll have to document. And if you start to document it, you'll have to document based on these criteria on that slide. So a scenario, a customer is considering entering into a lease for equipment to manufacture widgets. The lease has a five-year term with an option exercisable by the lessee only to extend the lease for an additional two years. The monthly rental payments escalate at an industry accepted rate based on inflation plus a margin. Um, the escalation would also apply to the additional two-year period if the lessee exercises its extension option. The customer operates in a remote location where the cost of shipping and installation for pieces of equipment are significant. Um, so for how many, leases, well, how many years would the lease term be in this case? Now again, um, one would say, listen, if I end my lease term of the equipment after five years, I have to pay a lot of extra cost of shipping and installation to get a different piece of equipment. And therefore, you know, realistically, I'll rather extend for another two years and defer all that shipping cost. So the lease term in that case, seven years. A, a different scenario, let's say a company enter into a contract to lease a property for four years with an option to extend the contract for a further four years. Lease payments are $100,000 per year over the non-cancellable period of the lease of four years and the four-year period covered by the extension option. Um, so that's quite unreal, you know, we're not going to have an increase in our lease payments. Now the following factors are also relevant. Market rentals for comparable uh, property in that area are expected to increase by 2.7% per year. Over that eight year period, we're not going to have any increases. Uh, we intend to stay in business in the same area for the next 10 years, so there's no compelling reason to move to another area. And the building, you know, is ideally located for our relationship with our suppliers and customers. So how many years is the lease term? Definitely eight years. Um, there's also rules around provisions to the lease term. So on day one, you have to make an assessment, a judgment on what the lease term is. And then there's also a requirement to, to consider revisions to the lease term. And there's two reasons why you could have revisions. Um, it could be that you have a reassessment of your original estimate or it could be that there are re-measurements due to modifications to your lease contract. Um, so if you look at the reassessment of the original estimate, uh, you know, it could be that there's a change in your intentions, your business practice, other unforeseen circumstances. Um, so a lessee is required to reassess the likelihood of its exercising or failing to exercise options um, and, sorry, you have to reassess it um, upon the occurrence of an event or a change in circumstances that's within the control of, of the lessee and affects whether the lessee is reasonably certain to exercise an option not previously included. Um, revisions to original estimates of the lease term resulting from reassessments as to the likelihood of exercising options results in re-measurements of the carrying value of leased assets and liabilities. So we have to recalculate uh, carrying value of those assets and liabilities and it can be quite a complex 
a process. And if we have remeasurements due to modifications, again the lease term may change if the lessee and lessor agree to modify the contract. And this is different to just revising our assessment or our judgment. And again, these contract modifications will also result in remeasurement of our lease asset and lease liability. Right, so um, when we change our judgment or when we change the contract, we have to remeasure these lease assets and we have to remeasure these lease liabilities. So key messages today as a wrap up. Um, it's really important as a lessee, if you currently have operating leases, to consider what would the impact be on your key ratios and other measures going forward. Uh, we expect that in the earlier years your profit will be lower because we've got this front end loaded interest expense. We expect interest before interest tax depreciation and amortization EBITDA to increase. Um, your balance sheet ratios will be impacted and the main reason is you're now getting a non-current asset on your books uh, uh, but you don't get a current asset on your books, it's a non-current asset. However, on the liability side you get a current liability and a non-current liability. So if your bank covenants are linked to net current assets it will be impacted. Um, also it could impact declaration of dividends because it has an impact on profit and profit leads through to your declaration of dividends. Um, also a declaration of dividends in section 254T refers to do you have the, um, the net assets to make that payment. And then also are your bonuses and other profit um, related contracts will be impacted if it's based on profit because profit is impacted. So a few things to consider. Who will be most impacted? Retailers, we've spoken to a number of retail clients. Some retailers have hundreds of operating leases um, and they'll have to do amortization tables for each one of them um, and especially on transition, which we'll talk about at some stage, uh, a huge number of calculations for them. Mines and mining service companies, airlines, to keep uh, Sir David Tweedy happy um, and then businesses with fleets of motor vehicles and definitely any entity that has that are lessees with significant operating leases under the current ASB 117 will be impacted. Remember we've got a number of newsletter vid videos webinars that you can get the details from on our website or you can contact me on my email address, follow me on LinkedIn Follow BDO Australia on LinkedIn. If you've got questions, please email them through to me. Otherwise, I'm saying thank you very much for joining me um, today for this webinar. Uh, there's a recorded webinar on leases in January on our website. We've got today's one looking at two big judgment calls, identifying a lease, determining the lease term, and then next month we go on to doing the calculations, looking at calculating the right of use asset, calculating the liability, and how does that flow through over the lease term. So thank you very much for joining me today. Hope you've got a good day, and we'll speak again next month.